Grim Fandango, 15 years later. How does it feel being on stage talking about this game? It's unbelievable. It's awesome. I've been waiting for this, for this day. <laughs> it's hot for a long time. Uh, Can I just ask the crowd, how many people in this audience have actually played the original Grim Fandango? Very cool. Wait, are you going to ask the other question? You go ahead. How many people have never played Grim Fandango in your life? I'd love to see that too. Oh, great. Yeah. See? <laughs> we're, counting on, we're counting on both of you to make this work, yeah. to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, we're knee deep in production on Remastered, yeah. and I was wondering how it's going with the team at Double Fine. The game is running currently on the, on the PS4, the PC, and the Vita, and awesome. it's looking great. We're doing a whole new renderer for the game, and so you'll see it in kind of a modern look. Um, but, you know, still retaining the original game as much as possible. This is Manny in, uh, here in Maya. Um, this is, these are the original meshes and uh, the textures. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're hoping to up-res all the textures. This is the original head down here. So it was originally, you know, this big. And you can see how it doesn't look so great. And then I um, did this first texture and I recreated it at 2048. So we'll just be able to, um, you know, replace that with this. Some of them are, these are pretty straightforward. Some of them are tricky. So this is a shoe. And I think um, you know, some of these textures are quite dark. So here's the original one. Of course, we've increased the size. I mean, we're increasing the size about 16 fold, I think, from the original textures. So you see, you see something like this. And um, sometimes, you know, there's a certain style to things that was intentional, right? Like probably their choice to make this square was intentional because it was playing off the angularity of the models, like the foot's like a wedge. Mm -hmm. And obviously they're not doing a lot of subtle gradients because their palette was limited and the models were simple. But some of this is just repalletization garbage. And the trick is knowing what is what and then figuring out where to take it. And having worked on games in the same era as this, I remember a lot of these artifacts. And uh, I, I, so, so I, don't think, I don't feel like that's intentional, right? So, one of the things we do is we just clean that up and make that a solid fill. We're just trying to basically clean it up and remove what I believe to be artifacting without changing the stylistic intent of the game. Um, something I would really like to get done would be to make sure that the lighting system on the characters, the new real-time lighting system, is better than the original one. So I think the characters uh, often don't have much sense of directional lighting on them, even though the environments heavily do because they're based in film noir lighting, right? So I'd love to fix that because that, that looks bad. And those are the things that make the biggest visual difference by far. When I came on board, um, like the thing I talked to Lee about is like, okay, what do you need? And he said, like, we need an interactive way of like creating new light sources or changing them or like deleting light sources. And so that's the kind of pipeline I, I, uh, I worked on. Um, and, you know, as you can see, if I toggle between the old school, the original rendering and the new one, uh, even though this is my really crazy programmer lighting, you can already see it like looks way more interesting because you have shadows now, like he actually cast shadows on himself as you can see here, mm -hmm. right? And you just get a bit more depth out of it. And that's really important and you can obviously move the light source around to get like immediate feedback on, on how that would look. And you can create new light sources and see right away how that would look like in the game. Uh, and that, you know, makes a huge difference for the artists and then they can just tweak those values, like walk them around at different locations, see how the lighting looks there and maybe make some changes. It's really nice, I'm really enjoying it. I mean, the tools are, it's really cool to be able to just do it and watch it like hot reload and it's like instant satisfaction. And I mean, this is like, if you're gonna light a game, this is the game to light, right? It's, uh, it's got the greatest lighting ever, so, and, the, and a great mood and everything. So it's been a lot of fun. I mean, there are a lot of sets though to light. I think there's like 130 or something individual sets, so it's a lot of work. But it feels really good when you see the blinds from this angle, and then you walk over here, and if you look at the original game, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a huge difference there. I think it looks, I think it looks pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's cool that he casts shadows on, like, the tables and the walls and stuff. I don't think he did that in the original, let's see. No, he doesn't even, doesn't even have shadows over there. There he goes. <laughs> Wow, that's weird. They must have cut out sort of a shadow alpha in the original that just matches up perfectly with the lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is the thought of, you know, uh, are we gonna alienate 
the diehard fans by redoing this. I don't think so. I think uh, anyone that loves this game is gonna just love it even more. And we're not changing anything. Uh, and we're, that would be crazy, I think, to go in and try to change stuff because we're we're diehard fans of this game, you know. So the thing is, it's really hard, right? I mean, working on heritage games is really really hard because you have to make certain artistic decisions or decisions that some people interpret as like this is not pure enough for us, or other people say, oh, you didn't go far enough. Like it's like all this entire gamut of different opinions that are there. And people feel very strongly about it too because those are games they love from their childhood, right? They don't want that to be, to be spoiled or ruined and stuff like that. And that's, of course, I'm totally understandable. We're making pretty good progress, I would say, in the project overall. We have a kind of rough ship date now, I guess, uh, it's early next year. I think it's good and Victor is working on the, the commentary and stuff like that. And it's all pretty exciting to see all those things like coming together. Uh, the commentary stuff went really well. Um, we had, it was like five different groups. Each group was a different discipline that we had come in and do recording. We had so many weird technical problems with this game because there was nothing else like it. Yeah. And the, we were cobbling together, you know, really good bits of technology, but nobody had put all these things together before. Yeah. And it was a huge amount of work. <laughs> Huge but pain in the ass. It was a huge <laughs> pain in the ass. But then you see lines like this, and yeah. it's like every time you just want to take your computer and throw it out the window because you're, you know, you're up against some wall or something. Then you look at the content or like the big wall of Peter Chan art or, yeah. or that kind of stuff, and you're like, nah, I'm going to turn around and go back and and yeah. keep working on it. Luckily, the development team didn't go too far from San Francisco when um, when they left Lucas Arts, so it was able to. It was easy for us to be able to get everybody back together and in the recording studio all at once. And people seem to remember a lot of stuff about the game as well. So it made it, um, it was a really nice candid conversation about how the development went, some of the challenges that, that they experienced along the way, little fun facts about the game, that sort of stuff. So it went really well, actually. Can I move this mic or you visit over here because you, can't, you don't want this to stop? How about now, but now? I still remember writing a big justification about tank controls when I was pitching this. I was thinking, Tank controls, I thought, were superior to point and click at the time because when you're pointing and clicking, you're distant from the screen, and the screen is this other thing that you're interacting with at your fingertips. Right, right. You're but saying, when you're doing tank yeah. controls, you feel like you are in the center of the character, right? And the world is rotating. You wrote the world's rotating around you, and so when you you think instead of going, I want to go on the left of the screen or I want to go to the right of the screen, you're saying, I want to look at the thing to the left of me and the mm -hmm. thing to the right of me. Mm -hmm. And now, I, you know, I don't know if that was necessarily the right decision, but it's it's a good piece of evidence that you can somehow, sometimes make a really good argument for the wrong decision. <laughs> and that's something to watch out for in life. <laughs> it's mostly just, it's just funny how you see something like that you haven't seen in years and you remember exactly the day you put it together. Just like seeing a certain scene that you worked on a lot, you're like, oh God, I remember that day. I put that all together and it just feels so, so like it was just yesterday. But you haven't thought about it for 15 years. I mean, I have a whole new perspective on the game you know, having not played it for years, you know, just on the dialogue and listening to things that I still write the same way and things that I don't write the same way anymore. This part of the game, I always feel like um, my writing has changed a lot since this, like I was really, I was really trying to write good dialogue here, which to me at the time meant a lot of like puns and <laughs> like um, wordplay, like this suit is just, this, this deck of cards is a lot like me. It's uh, ragged around the edges, but I've got, more suits. And I, feel, I forget what it is, but it's like everything had to be this kind of like bon mot. Well, that's kind of Chandler esque too. I mean, you know. But kind of. But I think I ease off on it in Act Two. I think I just start writing Act uh, or in Year Two. There's a lot more just normal talking, which I right. think uh, I kind of like a little bit more now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm rewriting the game in my head. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying not to rewrite the music. So Peter, yeah, so Peter McConnell, we, f we were able to recover all of the different music sessions um, that were originally created for the game. I think the audio was uncompressed, but I think Peter McConnell wishes we could add live recordings to it, which would be amazing because he's a lot of, even though we did live musicians for a lot of it, there's some stuff that is patches, like, and he, he hates his old patches and he wants to redo it. Here again.
what a strange part I wrote. And that's probably what I should be doing in all those solos, huh? Yeah. In the um, sax solo, what do you think about going to just like a straight muted thing with chicks? Like, yeah, it, it'll be a little more like definitely. It's too much period, and then and then start. But or not, I mean, just like not front funky, ch but ch like that. Just, just just the back beats. Oh. Ch 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 and holding off, and then when the trumpet solo starts, kind of open it up a little more. Uh, and then come back in big with the band. Sounds good to me. <clears throat> Just kind of give it some shape. Yeah, there was no guitar part there before, and it's we're finding it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's a. It is. It's like it's practically bebop. Yeah. You know, it's. it's when well, that's really, sitting in the right spot, it's, it's great. Man. And then for. Um, all the really key moments of the game, we're going to Melbourne and we're going to be having the symphony in Melbourne um, record a live session of the orchestra playing these, these, uh, these music pieces. Uh, it's going to be amazing. It's something that we, we worked with the same group for the first act of Broken Age. Um, and they did an amazing job, so we were able to, to get the same group together to help us with Grim Fandango. Now that we know the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, like it'd be amazing to actually go down there and... Da -da -da. Yeah, it was just such a, a wonderful game and, and the story was great and the puzzles were sort of spot on and the really great thing about the score and that is that it was just another character uh, within the game. Um, and I think it's one of those great examples of, whether it's in film music or anything else, where um, I'm not convinced the game would have been as successful as it was if it wasn't for that amazing score that accompanied everything. And yeah, it's just such an amazing um, situation where we can actually record that scored live with a full orchestra, all of those timbres and sounds and textures and everything that a full orchestra can bring. Um, we can actually bring that to this HD remake, which is really, really exciting. People do react to that because they hear humans playing human instruments and it is part of the game experience that, they, that these people are going to immerse themselves in. When video games were, were starting to being made and started to to translate from a big machine that you could only go to in a physical parlour to something that you could put on your home PC, creativity was amazing because there was no kind of uh, understood base for what things were. Uh, it was a fresh field, it was a blue sky, it was any of these things going on. People had to create and, and I thought it was wonderful that that I can live in a time where I've seen those begin and now we're going back and we're, we're, we're re-cooking them. But uh, look, the project is, is, is exciting because uh, it's like a, a heritage game, isn't it? You know, it's like a historically informed uh, musical performance practice in terms of this game that's now 20 years old. So uh, look, it's fascinating. And uh, I think uh, to be already kind of, in a sense, going back and looking at the history of video games, it's hard to believe, you know, history. I mean, they didn't exist when I started reading comics, but, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating, really. And if it draws in a whole new generation of people to this very unusual and quite captivating world that's created in Grim Fandango, then uh, it's all good as far as I'm concerned.